Hello and welcome to Insight. I am Rami Niranjan Desai and today I have a very special guest for us from across our eastern border, Mr. Shariar Alam. Mr. Alam is the State Minister of Foreign Affairs for Bangladesh. He is also one of the most erudite voices on foreign policy in the region. Come join us today as we discuss the future of India-Bangladesh relations. Minister, thank you for joining me on Inside. It is such a privilege to have you with us. And this is such an interesting time for us because this is absolutely a historic visit led by your Prime Minister, uh, Sheikh Hasina, to our country. Uh, our country has had very old ties. Our relationships have been very strong. I really want to start off by asking you that we've initially, we have focused on areas like energy. We focused on areas like border management, on water, and this has been lauded across the world. Now, during this visit, we've heard a lot about economic exchange. What sort of potential do you think both our countries have, and how can we absolutely magnify it? Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, joining with you at the Insight, uh, and it's a fantastic initiative to reach out to your, uh, to your constituents. Uh, you know, of course, it's uh, always very important to come back and pay a visit uh, to Delhi, uh, as it was done by your President and uh, Honorable uh, President and Prime Minister. In the same calendar year, uh, that itself is a history uh, that was created, uh, at, and uh, I wish uh, we could match that. <laughs> uh, uh, that was to celebrate our uh, birth century of the father, founding father of the nation, the uh, greatest Bengali of all time, as you call him, uh, Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman and to celebrate the uh, golden jubilee of our relationship, so is our independence. And 50 years on, uh, we all know it's a different Bangladesh. A Bangladesh, we aspired and you aspired, your predecessors, uh, the, the generations who helped us uh, during the war of liberation, uh, not, but, uh, not only uh, you know, shedding their blood and made supreme sacrifices, but by also sa sheltering over 10 million at least uh, uh, Bangladeshis, uh, uh, especially in, uh, in the bordering area of Kolkata or, you know, or Greater West Bengal and also in Tripura and, and in some parts of Assam and Meghalaya, as I'm sure. Uh, it's a Bangladesh uh, who aspired to be a middle-income country and it's a vision uh, that we termed as digital Bangladesh. Now, digital didn't necessarily mean that digitalizing the work process. It's all about speed and bringing transparency, uh, so prosperity as well. So while we prosper, we do it, want to do it in a much more transparent manner. Uh, and uh, we're very glad that uh, even though the plan was announced in way back in 2009, that by 2021 we'll be a middle income country. And that was the exact deadline that we have hit, the UN, United Nations, and IMF and World Bank, well, all the three parameters that goes with it while considering and tick all the boxes. That has happened. So we are already a lower middle income country. Now while we are still uh, you know, somewhat uh, good another three years uh, to graduate officially after 2026, we have already announced that by 2041, Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina announced that uh, new target, that uh, by 2041 uh, we will become a higher income country. Now this is the time when we are visiting Delhi. Uh, the objectives are pretty much similar but we have new targets, new figures in mind. Uh, our export to India uh, was, uh, you know, we struggled heavily because we have a very uh, small export basket and you have wide range. Uh, you know, all the fantastic number that you uh, come to know about textile and our export uh, reaching 30 billion, 40 billion and last year it has uh, cost 52 billion led by garments which is uh, 40 billion plus. Majority of the raw material comes from India. Uh, so that's why there is a trade imbalance. Now, while we don't mind uh, about that, but we need to export as well and try and narrow that gap. We are never going to match uh, India's volume uh, exports to Bangladesh. It, it's simply not possible because we don't produce um, food grains we import from you. We don't produce the spices, the, you know, the lentils, the onions, and it goes without saying the rice and um, the wheat. Uh, but the cotton, the industrial raw material, still construction material, uh, they call it uh, stone chips, aggregate, technically speaking, coal. So it's always meant to be in your favor, uh, if you understand. 
But uh, still, there, are po there were possibilities, and the Indian government uh, was kind enough to make our product largely textile duty-free into India. But uh, we really couldn't take the benefit of it, because there are some non-tariff barriers. The states were behaving differently. I'm talking about a couple of years ago. But the situation has changed. You know, it, it's, it takes time to change, and you know, time is the best healer, as the saying goes. Even though there were political will, there were legislations in place, but the infrastructure, the ports, the borders. Uh, Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina made a very bold decision that as far as India is concerned, we will take our connectivity to pre-65 days. Even though Pakistan and India were, sep were separated, up until 65, the, the travel were easy. I was told that you even didn't require a passport to come to each other's country and things like that. That's what I heard from my parents and my grandparents. But uh, uh, all those Borders were closed, and you know we were part of Pakistan. So that's why she said pre-65. And uh, if we, if you revisit all those charts and points and you know things to do, we are almost there. We are almost there. In 90 percent cases, uh, you know we are in pre-65 days. So in this visit, of course, uh, you know Bangladesh came to tell you that you know we are better prepared. Bangladesh is ready for business. Uh, the the first lot, not necessarily first generation, the first lot of Indian businesses tried Bangladesh. Uh, they are successful. We had a uh, meeting uh, in presence of Prime Minister uh, with uh, Chamber, uh, Indian Chamber of Commerce, CCI. And the businesses who are already operating, uh, in some cases for a decade, in some cases for three, four years, they shared their experiences. and. Uh, I'll pick up one example. The company who's responsible to set up a special economic zone in Mongla, which is not too far from Kolkata, it's within Greater Khulna Division for the ease of the viewers to understand, uh, is almost uh, to near completion. And while making his very brief remark for two minutes, he assured Prime Minister Hasida that it's almost ready, and Madam Prime Minister, do not worry about. Uh, the businesses that you are planning. Uh, I have received enough interest. Uh, the ACZ will be full of uh, Indian. It's India-specific economic zone. So that's in Mongla. So that's the future. So what I was trying to get at from that number, we struggled with the first billion. It has taken us a while to reach to the first billion. We're already knocking at the door of $2 billion export. So you know, gradually, as opposed to your 15 or $17 billion, we're, the number looks small. But uh, it's quite a lot uh, with the export basket that we have. Uh, it would be fantastic if we can reach $5 billion in a couple of years. Uh, so that's why economy is, is a priority. And uh, whenever uh, Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina and Prime Minister Narendra Modi gets together in a meeting, whether that's a bilateral or in a multilateral or SARC or BIMSTEC or any other forum, uh, they always identify commonly that uh, poverty, garibi, is our uh, biggest enemy, uh, not necessarily only enemy, unfortunately, uh, you know, the world that we live in. So we need to address that. And everyone speaks about Asia, how good India is doing, how well the other Asian countries were doing off late. But we see the growths were so vulnerable, you know, a couple of our neighbors uh, are struggling uh, heavily. I, I wish that they can come out of this misery soon. Uh, so we need to make our growth uh, sustainable, uh, and that's why we need a guaranteed uh, uh, source of our raw material. Uh, supply needs to be ensured. So one of the proposals we made, and we have received uh, a positive response, it's in the joint statement as well, that especially for food grain, for the rice, wheat, lentil, onions, and a couple of five or six categories, India will try and assure a minimum export volume to Bangladesh, regardless of you know what goes on here, it's a, it's a difficult one. But uh, you know, uh, friends and neighbors, and especially friends like Bangladesh in, in India, and the relationship is not comparable with any other relationship, I would say, because of the history, and the past, the past prior 47, post 47, post 71, and in, re in recent last uh, you know uh, eight nine years. Uh, so it's a it's uh, kind of reiterating our uh, previous commitments at the same time setting up new targets. It's not going to be easy to achieve those targets, 
but that's why good, good friends are for, good neighbors are for, we'll be working together. Absolutely right. Uh, but we've also heard some discussions on SIPA. Mm -hmm. uh, where do you think these discussions have reached? Is there a roadmap to make this a success? Yes, uh, we have a very tiny specific roadmap. And you know, that's the beauty of it. You know, we didn't speak in these terms in the past. And that's what transparency, digital Bangladesh and digital India is all about at the same time. Is that, you know, time bound, uh, you know, objectives and targets. Uh, the, 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 the study is done by both the parties. Uh, they will start uh, negotiations soon. And we have told each other's uh, departments and ministries that to conclude within these, this calendar yet by 2022. So, you know, which is only three Which is away. not too far yeah, away. Exactly. Uh, high, high, you know, aims and agendas. Um, I also want to um, talk to you a little bit about, you've already mentioned, you know, there's been a steady rate of growth. It's almost been called a miracle by a lot of media houses. Uh, Bangladesh has also been lauded for its uh, high human development indicators. Um, even though you've mentioned a little bit of it, could you elaborate on how sustainable is this and what are the lessons that not just Bangladesh has learned, but also South Asia? Hmm. Well, um, you know, uh, I'm glad that you have uh, used miracle uh, as uh, an uh, expression. But uh, I've heard people using paradox, uh, which is a slightly derogatory term uh, in my consideration. A paradox when you say it, it wasn't expected out of Bangladesh, you know, but miracle doesn't necessarily say that. It was always expected for, from this region, for India in general, the, the old greater India and this subcontinent. Reason being is that we were the richest, the most active uh, economic region of the world up until like 300 years ago, prior to the British came in and invaded and took away all our wealth. So it's only a matter of time that wealth is coming back. You know, someone said to me once, uh, that was good 10 years ago, you know, the, and that point of time, uh, or about 15 years ago, in fact, that wealth is traveling from west to east, but got stuck in Middle East for the time being. Uh, you know, and uh, that was a kind of probably an oversimplification to someone's standard. But uh, on a serious note, uh, this region uh, uh, had all the potentials. One is the demographic dividend. As much as you, you have, uh, we have uh, the demographic dividend. But the interesting thing is uh, we, as a country, Bangladesh, is going to lose demographic dividend at a faster pace than India. So you, so you have a better chance. You'll have that you know, young workforce for a much longer period than compared to Bangladesh. And that process starts from mid-30s. And it, the dividend goes away completely by early 40s. So that's not too far from today. That's about 15, 20 years from today. And uh, if Bangladesh is a country of uh, nearly uh, $3,000 per capita income, and to take it to, let's say, $8,000, probably 15 years is not good enough. And by the time uh, we host, majority of our population becomes uh, elderly, we need uh, you know, a lot of cash, we need a lot of facilities built to look after uh, that aging population. Look at what's happening in case of Japan, Singapore, and some other countries. But you know, they are well above our kind of, um, all these uh, achievements that we have made collectively. So we need to do a lot, we need to achieve uh, a lot uh, in, in coming days. Uh, but uh, Bangladesh, of course, uh, uh, the growth, uh, the social indicators is sustainable uh, because, first of all, we didn't achieve that overnight. We didn't achieve that in just two, three, five years. Uh, it was a very long-term uh, plan, economic plan and social plan laid out by Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina, a person who traveled the country extensively uh, while she was meeting uh, Honorable uh, President. And she's not too far from uh, originated from, uh, you know, not too far from Bangladesh. She's from Urissa. And we have, uh, you know, one common uh, friend and enemy, which is the mother nature. Every cyclone that, you know, hits the Bay of Bengal, you know, travels, it hits Urissa fast and then, you know, make a right swing, you know, uh, in swing into Bangladesh, if you look into the Bay and the map. So, uh, the first of all, one was uh, literacy. Uh, we, we worked really hard. The only time, uh, prior uh, seven years ago, uh, the primary schools were nationalized uh, in 1973-74 by Father of the Nation. The second time around, about seven years ago, all the remaining uh, 22,000 
uh, school, primary schools were nationalized by Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina. So all the primary education is nationalized. All these students, girl students, now that's what helped the women empowerment. Girl students are, uh, are getting a cash, uh, uh, um, cash uh, scholarship of stipend. Uh, and the money is going into their mother's mobile account, not to their father. And Prime Minister have a, you know, a funny way of explaining you know, why money shouldn't be going to their fathers. Uh, which, uh, you know, but we men don't uh, like too much, needless to say that. But uh, uh, that's, uh, you know, on a serious note, 50 taka, you know very well, in rural India also, to a poor woman, if someone is giving her 50 taka a month, in Delhi, it's, it's nothing probably. But in rural India, still 50 taka will give, will probably not buy an awful lot of things, but will give that family a lot of confidence that I have that 50 taka reserve. I know the 50 taka is coming first of next month, you know, first of October or something. So, you know, uh, that gave them the confidence. Uh, but sometime uh, during this COVID, uh, we have seen the girls were away from the schools. Uh, so we have seen rise uh, of child marriage. I'm being honest here. Uh, and that's, you know, something that we have worked with uh, extensively. We have made fantastic improvement in, um, you know, removing uh, you know, child marriage or underage uh, marriage. But uh, COVID, uh, you know, young girls were left home and parents uh, couldn't kind of run the family or, you know, they were spending, uh, uh, they had very little to do, not going to school. Uh, so they ended up marrying them at a younger age. Uh, of course, COVID is over. So we need to catch up with the achievements that we made up until 2019, but we have lost heavily in 20 and 2021 and 2020, part of 2022. Uh, so that's of catching up. Uh, we have introduced as many as, I think, 36 different uh, uh, subsidy uh, program uh, for rationing program, uh, you know, health service related program. Uh, immunization is a great success story in Bangladesh. And that's why in no time uh, we have achieved, uh, you know, 90% plus uh, inoculation rate, the vaccination rate for COVID. Uh, as soon as it was available. Availability, making sure the supply was, was challenging. But as soon was as soon as it was available, in one single day, uh, you know, we had this week-long campaign. Uh, we inoculated 10 million people in a single day, and that that, that was huge. That was huge. Yep. So we have that uh, uh, volunteers as well as the health workers who help that process. Uh, so we have you know series of that, and you know World Economic Forum, uh, different UN agencies when they bring out these reports. Bangladesh fare uh, better than the, you know other neighboring countries. Uh, at the same time, uh, you know uh, the challenge is this uh, issue, problem like COVID, but also the natural disasters. In the coastal area of Bangladesh, we see uh, it's very difficult to fight uh, poverty there because there is uh, there is always a new inclusion. You, every time there's a high tide season you don't necessarily come to know in big news is because you know we all have priority in in 30 hours news cycle you can only you know uh, inform 10 um, headlines or whatever or two analysis but you know even if the cyclone is not necessarily hitting bangladesh heavily but if there is a cyclone if there is a depression in the bay there will be high tide there will be fresh area that will be inundated with salty water and the moment salty water gets in you know there will be a at least one season of crops will be lost now, 20% of Bangladesh, which is the coastal area of Bangladesh, is either affected by high tide or high wind, and the level of salinity is increasing in the river system. So they cannot cultivate the traditional crops like uh, rice or wheat or vegetable, or the freshwater fish. So they are forced to take uh, professions like uh, producing salt or shrimp, cultivating shrimp. Now, you know, as a country, we cannot handle only so much of shrimp, you know. Uh, so they need to adopt themselves with, with new profession, new job, and which is not very easy. So that's something that will hold us back always. But uh, adaptability, uh, you know, adaptation and mitigation, are, you know, the, the, the term that we use when you talk about climate change, is something where we have excelled as well. We have improved our uh, uh, forecast system system and also disseminating the information uh, people who are going deep into the sea for fishing 30 40 50 nautical miles 
uh, not necessarily coming back before the cyclone is hitting. You know, there's an example two weeks ago, the Indian Coast Guard rescued 66 Bangladeshi, Bangladeshi fishermen. We do the same sometime, the number is uh, probably smaller. Uh, our Coast Guard also rescued, uh, you know, uh, fishermen from Mauritius and West Bengal and, um, uh, you know, other uh, coastal areas. Uh, but uh, to answer your question uh, straight, uh, the, the process that we follow now, uh, Bangladesh currently have 100% electrification. It's a very recent achievement. We do not have any family who is uh, either landless or homeless. Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina's program in last four years in particular, we have completed delivering um, a couple of weeks back. Everyone, uh, her intention was that during the Mujib Barsha, which was in 2021, uh, but we have achieved it uh, earlier this year, uh, that 100% uh, housing, very humble facility, but still, you know, they are not in open, they are not in shanties, they are not in a vulnerable situation anymore. Uh, and uh, the process that we have started is uh, to fight poverty, the data, the purity of data, who is the most needy one, who is in distress, Identifying them uh, was a challenge initially because, you know, in politics, in rural areas, people who are following a particular leader will get a priority. That's no longer the case. We have brought transparency in that. So, you know, we have that data and uh, we have helpline. During the COVID, we introduced this 333 333 number. And anyone and everyone, you know, who is calling and making a distress call uh, will, will be sent out with the help. Uh, so, uh, the work is still on, uh, our uh, budgetary allocation in education is the highest and the second highest in social safety network. And this social safety network is still wide enough uh, to cover all the new entrants, hopefully little less going forward, uh, because we are building heavier uh, structures in the coastal areas. But it's a, it's a continuous kind of work in progress or something that we will have to repeat in coming years as well. Well, congratulations on these markers, you know, whether it's 100% uh, electrification or, like you said, education or housing. But what really interests me is your take on uh, the importance of uh, supporting women. In that light, uh, what are the lessons, if I may ask you, that the Islamic world can learn from Bangladesh? You have a uh, very dynamic leader at the helm and she's clearly taken a personal interest. What is it that the rest of the Islamic world can learn from you? Uh, well, uh, I think uh, uh, there's a bit of a delicate uh, issue here. Uh, I think misrepresentation of the fact, uh, you need to know the religion uh, well and better. Uh, our Prophet Hazrat Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was first married to a woman who was senior to him and also she uh, used to run a business and our prophet used to help her to run that business. So business for women or working outside home was always allowed. There's no argument on that. But we have these new generation so-called uh, you know, Islamic leaders who went on to say to people that you know, uh, women at the age, you know, beyond, they are not allowed to go to school beyond the age of five. They cannot go out for work and you know, they cannot do certain things that men can do. Those are very wrong. But if that belief becomes somewhat popular and acceptable, it becomes very difficult for a political government who needs to go back and you know, ask for a vote every five years to his or her constituents. Unless you disseminate that information loud and clear, it's very, it becomes very sensitive and you end up taking a huge political risk. Now, I think the failure in other democratic countries in the Islamic world is that they were not confident enough. They didn't, the messaging was wrong. They didn't want it confront this ideology, which was wrong. It's, it's not an ideology. It's, it's, a, it's a smear campaign uh, for some political gain by some certain political quarter and political party who plays the religious card every, you know, every now and then often uh, for the gain, for the narrow gain. So I think the confidence from Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina, and it was a top-down approach. If anyone to be credited, the only one to be credited is Sheikh Hasina here. There's, you know, no, there's, no one comes next to her. Uh, and uh, it, it's applauded. Uh, I hope uh, and I'm confident that uh, you know, we'll be able to maintain that. Uh, but we, we have confronted uh, a completely opposite ideology in recent times, in recent past. I cannot guarantee that you know, we, we don't need to confront that in future. 
uh, it's, it's a possibility because, uh, you know, there are large group of people who still believe uh, that's not the right approach. And because, uh, you know, they have these uh, very narrow political um, uh, achievements or objectives to achieve, rather, uh, which they want to achieve. Uh, and uh, that's a shortcut they're taking. Uh, and uh, I, I hope just that they will take a listen from the other countries uh, in the neighborhood or beyond. Uh, there's not many countries in that category. You know, it's very unfortunate what's happening. Uh, you know, countries that we thought came out of that dark age but kind of made a re-entry uh, recently. Uh, so we need to take a listen uh, from those uh, uh, failures. All right, let me come back to one of the points that you made earlier about uh, you know, the kind of climate change and the impact of that, and you've had to adapt. But of course, you know, uh, both India and Bangladesh uh, need to come together towards, the, uh, towards climate change and what's happening in Bay of Bengal. How do you think that both of us, uh, both these countries can work towards mitigating this potential crisis? Um, you know, before mitigation, we, we need to work on adaptability, uh, adaptability. Uh, adaptation uh, and uh, we have I, I, I would love to believe that we have done a decent job uh, because the the cyclone that used to kill well uh, since even started keeping record uh, you know just to put it on the record straight the worst na worst ever natural disaster in the history of mankind was Vola cyclone of 1970 I think that was uh, 11th or 12th of uh, November and in one night one million people perished. So that was one cyclone. Of course, we had, have had ba bad cyclones since then also, especially in 1988, uh, you know, a uh, couple of hundred thousand, uh, at least uh, two, 200,000 plus people died. Uh, but gradually, we have learned to adopt ourselves. The messaging was, uh, was uh, efficient. A uh, number of uh, volunteers who were working, uh, you know, after the cyclone or, you know, when the high wind and rain subsides and, you know, go back to them and rescue them and give them food and shelter because people die after the cyclone as well. Uh, so the fatalities and casualties is a lot less. It's only in hundreds, uh, but, uh, you know, we need to bring it down even further. Uh, so adaptation is first. On mitigation, uh, of course, uh, it's, you know, we are speaking here September 2022. Uh, the countries in the West, let's say Germany, it's no harm naming uh, because the subject that we are talking about uh, was applauded uh, greatly you know because they are the first country that went almost green there was a particular day a couple of years ago when all of their energy was green on that particular day now because of the crisis uh, the fuel supply uh, from russia or ukraine and shortage of gas is prompting them to go back to coal or kind of restart the sh plant they have uh, shut down you know, a decade ago or five years ago. So I hope we are not reversing the process. We are not going back. It's a temporary problem. And if I consider this to be a temporary problem, the second, of course, comes that whatever we invest into, it needs to be sustainable environmentally. Now, that's an expensive proposition because those countries, uh, you know, utilize that 50 years or 100 years of their development journey. And they did it the way they wanted to do it. There were no legislation, you know. There are countries who, uh, you know, killed their river that was flowing through the capital. Then once they made enough money, they went back to the river and cleaned it up for billions and trillions of dollars. Now, I'm not too sure whether that's the option for us. Uh, option for us is because all of we are committed that our development journey will have to be sustainable. And that will slow us down. Uh, that will make the process expensive. Uh, so we need to work harder because it's, it's a conscious decision we have made. Whatever commitment we have made at the COP, it's not just compulsion or, you know, someone pressed you or, you know, everyone else encircled you. It's, it was a voluntary commitment. So we need to live up to those expectations and commitment. Uh, and uh, we need to make a regular review. Uh, and we need people's awareness. It's, you know, it starts from there. There are businesses that pollute the environment and we have the individuals that pollute the environment. So from individual point of view, that's relatively easier to manage because some industry needs to be, you know, you need to have those industries in place uh, to, for the supply of the product. But the, in our lifestyle, there are a lot of things that we do, excessive use of the drinking water. 
excessive use of electricity. Uh, so we need to micromanage those uh, to you know, reverse the process if we are to bring it down to 1.5 degrees Celsius. The forecast is still it's going well above 2.5 degrees Celsius. Uh, so we need to be innovative. Uh, I know uh, in, in solar and green energy, you know, India is, is leading from the front. Uh, the solar alliance that Prime Minister uh, Narendra Modi launched a couple of years ago, uh, I, I think, um, uh, I, uh, I, I attended that program as well. Uh, and there are commitments. Uh, India is also helping the neighbors uh, to achieve that. So we need to work together and be innovative. And, uh, you know, uh, we need to utilize our uh, science and scientific and uh, population, uh, you know, uh, in those particular area to have to lead a smarter life. Um, also, for us, great focus is on the northeast region of India. So shifting your attention there for a bit, I'd like to ask you, how do you think that India and Bangladesh can come together to uh, confront some of the security challenges that we've had there? Uh, well, uh, I love to believe that it's a past, um, but uh, you know, we, that inspires us. That was the first phase in addressing the problem. And Bangladesh played a key role. Uh, Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina declared zero tolerance and not allowing the land, uh, even one inch of land to be used by any of those uh, rebel or separatist or you know, whichever way you want to call them. So if that is the past, the present and future is that you know, uh, deliver the promises that we have made or rather let's say government of India made to the people of the uh, Northeast. And Bangladesh uh, always said uh, we'd love to be part of that. We have opened our mission in Assam, and that's the only uh, mission of a foreign country in Assam uh, till date, and this has been like four or five years. And uh, we feel attest, uh, Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina today even um, uh, in Delhi uh, met uh, your minister for uh, development of Northeast, and uh, we have identified areas. We have made a very specific proposal, and we have requested the minister uh, to approach through MEA uh, for a high level, preferably all the chief minister travels to Bangladesh, or if we are invited, we can do a two, three day session because this will have to be extensive. This will have to be time bound, specific numbers, targets, uh, you know, and prior to that, some research. And before we sit together, we must do our own homework. Uh, that it is very much possible uh, for importation and exportation. One of the contentious issues within Bangladesh was allowing India transit. And that's again a very brave call decision made by Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina allowing India to use our ports and river system and road facilities and train facilities. So Northeast is not yet utilizing that. Uh, we are doing, we have agreed to do four trials through our ports, two trial uh, as we speak this week. Uh, we are into the uh, you know, second, first week of September and uh, the first ship has arrived in Chittagong uh, yesterday. And uh, from that, there on, uh, things will be distributed through trucks and rail system into northeastern states. But you have your exportable. The minister was talking about tea exportation. And Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina said, of course, you know, there's uh, no issue as far as we are concerned. And I, I was talking to you about the pre-65 days connectivity. So we have revived most of those, but there are two, three bridge and culverts, smaller ones, needs to be built. So we need to make some investment. Uh, India needs to improve. Uh, the quality of uh, uh, physical infrastructure uh, in their India's part uh, in terms of immigration and customs warehousing. Uh, your high commissioners and representatives visited that place and they agreed that, you know, but it, it seems that India have some issue with the land uh, acquisition and uh, because you have these, uh, region, uh, these state government and central government and you know, things like that. But, you know, I'm sure for greater good, for greater interest, everyone will, will agree to that. But to what we have proposed is the chief minister visits with the minister and with their people that matters in this respect, sits together and uh, we'll have you know, government level meeting, high level meeting, ministerial meeting, departmental meeting, meeting with businesses, and we'll identify what are the you know, 50 things or even if it is 100 things that we need to do together. And we'll put up specific time frame. You know, we'll do a critical path analysis and you know, say what needs to be done when. So Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina said she's willing to do that. So I think it's a great offer and India should grab it. And uh, you know, Northeast uh, uh, will, 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 be, will be relieved uh, from a lot of these uh, agonies because of the geographical location, you know, can't undo that. 
and it is very much possible uh, because we have a will willful neighbor. Uh, you have uh, gone back to the uh, point of pre-1965 interconnectivity, which, of course, I think both sides agree uh, is really, really important to the future of both the countries. Having said that, um, how do you think if we were to achieve this sort of connectivity, uh, would it be a balancing factor or an integrating factor for the BIMSTEC region itself? Um, w we host this secretariat in Dhaka. So, you know, I'm just sharing that information to make it loud and clear how committed we are. Uh, but unfortunately, of course, BIMSTEC comes with a huge potential, uh, but the instability in Myanmar uh, is stopping us from advancing further. Uh, but uh, the first uh, objective uh, BIMSTEC went on to set out at the summit and then at the ministerial is the uh, preferential uh, trade agreement, if not a full FTA among the BIMSTEC country. And uh, majority of the studies are done. The countries uh, uh, submitted their positive list. It's a, it's a reverse thing for BIMSTEC. In many other regional organizations, it's a negative list that we don't want these to be included. But we said, give us a positive list. So majority of the country member states submitted that list. So they are working on it. But uh, you know, that's on trade side. But the first thing we should must be doing is build connectivity, you know, cheaper, that means road, you know, easier. Uh, so that mass transport can, can fly and travel. But unfortunately, uh, it's currently not possible because state of Rakhine is the first choice. But I was told there is another choice that uh, we can make through the northern part of Myanmar. But uh, it seems that there are trouble in that neighborhood as well. So but it's a little unfortunate. We'll have to wait for uh, peace and tranquility in Myanmar. Uh, but the other member states uh, are, are, are in agreement, in full agreement. Uh, that uh, you know, we should uh, implement some of these uh, uh, plan into action soon. Minister, we've spoken about infrastructure, interconnectivity. I would like to know more about people-to-people -people connectivity. Uh, how does Bangladesh envision taking advantage of the huge tur tourist base that India has in terms of maybe uh, pilgrimage tourism to Bangladesh, uh, Cox's Bazaar, so on and so forth? Yeah, uh, we, we do have, you know, compared to India, which is, a, you know, one of the greatest location uh, for the tourists to come and visit. And you attract uh, the highest number of uh, tourists that comes from Bangladesh, 2.2 million during the pre-COVID year in 2019. Uh, that has put a lot of pressure uh, in your visa system, which you have tackled very successfully, thanks to the MEA's new initiatives and all that. Uh, but uh, we, we do not uh, attract as many, uh, simply because we do not have uh, uh, that level of facilities. But um, with the limited uh, resources that we have, uh, let's say Cox's Bazaar, uh, there are quite a few Buddhist temple, uh, you know, Otish Dipankar uh, stopped over there. Uh, Durga Puja, uh, which is celebrated uh, throughout India, mostly in the West Bengal, was originated in Ratshahi, a place called Taherpur. Uh, there are talks about revival, we need to rebuild a temple, and I'm sure there will be a lot of religious pilgrimage. There are other temples that, uh, you know, um, um, veterans and uh, seniors uh, who knows and uh, about the, uh, the existence of those fa facilities and uh, historic places visits from uh, India from all part from Northeast also uh, but we need to build better facilities and uh, that is for Indian businesses uh, you know that opens up an opportunity uh, I think India comes uh, next to none no one uh, in terms of hospitality the fantastic hotel and services that you provide so I think it's an opportunity for India to go and invest. Uh, you know, we'll accept and wait in open arms. But uh, we also have huge demand in domestic tourism. The local Bangladeshis, every weekend, you know, there will be a huge uh, traffic jam in the exit route uh, from the Dhaka city, which is one of the most populous uh, cities in the world. And on Sunday morning or Saturday night, there will be a huge uh, tailback uh, while entry. So that tells you that, uh, you know, and we know for sure that uh, during the weekend, there's no hotel rooms will go empty in Cox's Bazaar. As people are progressing economically, they have little more money in their pocket they can, uh, they can spe spend. So because of the high demand of domestic tourism, there's a lack of uh, seriousness by the investors because uh, the moment they want to go international and attract foreign tourists, they need to upgrade their facilities at a certain level that will require a lot of cash. I hope some of them will convert those facilities in, in the second phase, 
once they build their capital from the domestic tourism business, they'll go uh, international. But this is an area of, uh, that uh, we can cooperate, surely. Well, uh, Your Excellency, thank you for your time. And we look forward to you know, meeting you again and having you on our show once again. Thank you thank very much. Thank you very much. much. Lovely talking to you. Okay. Thank you. With India and Bangladesh relations hitting an all-time high with the visit of Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina to India recently, it is clear that the future is strong with the various agreements and partnerships that have been finalized in this visit. It is clear that this will not just benefit both the countries, but bring stability to the entire region. Thank you for watching Insight. Until next time.